Hey. Thank you. I appreciate being the old football coach. Throw a few booze in there and I'll feel right at home. <laughs> hey, I got a bone to pick with you guys, okay? All you Bucks fans, all those years, I brought those Redskins down here and I go in that stadium. Some of those names you call me, I don't even know what those things are. <laughs> I see a few red faces there. Hey, I'm still coaching, all right? I got, I got seven grandboys. When they get to be 10, I coach them in their first year of tackle football. Now, you want an experience? Try coaching 10-year-olds. I, I go out there the very first day, hey, we're lined up on offense, and I, I told them, okay, straight line, six-inch splits. All right, now get in your stance. And about three of them looked up at me and went, what's a stance? And I went, oh my gosh, I'm used to messing up 30-year-olds, not 10-year-olds. <laughs> and then the things they tell you. Okay, one of my favorites, we had Daniel. Hey, this kid looked great in the drills and everything. He is hammering people. And I go, it's his first year playing, but I said, this kid's, a, this kid's gonna be awesome. We're gonna play an offensive guard, defensive tackle. He's gonna control the line of scrimmage. This is great. We start our very first game, his first game, okay? And two plays into the game, Daniel comes walking off the field. He goes to my son, JD, who was the head coach. I'm the assistant coach. You gotta be nice to your kids, they're gonna pick the home, okay? <laughs> anyway, he goes to JD. I figure he, he did something like broke his chin strap or something. Sure enough, the next play, he goes back in. I said, we're all set. One play later, here he comes again. So I walk over this time and I cut him off and I went, Daniel, what's the deal? He looked up at me and he goes, they're hitting me in places where I don't have pads. I went just like this, I went, Daniel, see that bench over there? And he looked at the bench, he looks back at me, and I said, here's the deal in football. You can go sit on that bench for the rest of the game, or you can get in there and hit them where they don't have any pads. <laughs> so anyway, we're rocking and rolling. We got stuff going with the grandkids. And hey, this morning, hey, we just want you to have a great morning, okay? We got things lined up. We're gonna try and get you out of here for a full work day. And, um, a little bit later on, okay, we're gonna sign some books, or whatever you got. And so every time I think about that book, I think about my little spiritual father in Fayetteville, Arkansas, George Sterrell. And so one day I said to George, I said, George, I'm thinking about writing a book. And he looked right at me, he paused and he goes, do you have anything to say? <laughs> That's my best shot, okay, what's in that book. And so the other thing we're gonna do, hey, we'll take some photos over there. And, hey, I did wear my Super Bowl ring. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, here's the rule. You can take a photo with the Super Bowl ring. There's only one rule. You got to either be a Redskin fan or you lie for 10 seconds and tell me you're a Redskin fan. Okay, we got a deal. We got a deal, okay? I, I laugh because this ring's 91. I'll let the players design this one. They design them so big, okay? Get, they come in handy for about two things. You expect to be in a fist fight that day? <laughs> or if you're trying to get upgraded to first class, there's there happen to be these. <laughs> all right, we're all set. But I felt like, hey, it's only fair to you guys. You get stuck listening to me. I just want to tell you honestly, I'm going to be honest with you this morning, I'm going to tell you, hey, who you got here, and so some of this stuff is personal. I'm sure I can count on this group. It won't go outside this room. First thing I'm going to start off with and tell you how smart I am, I had life figured out at an early age. So, hey, I was going to play pro football. Hey, I got everything figured out. So it came time to graduate from high school, and I said, okay, it's time to pick a college. I'd moved to Southern California. I'm going down a list of colleges and I skipped over Harvard and Yale. May not be able to get in there. I kept going, I kept going. I went, what? I finally, San Diego State, Harvard of the West. I'll go there and play football. This is perfect. 
Okay, so I'm rocking and rolling. All of a sudden, I get to be a junior in college, and it dawned on me. I look down at this body. I could jump about that high. I could run about that fast. It wasn't going to happen. And I went, oh, my gosh. Now what am I going to do? Well, the first thing they told me, they said, you got to pick a major. I said, oh, okay, hey, I can do that. So I start down the list of majors. I skipped over neurosurgeon, physicist. I kept going. I go, what can I possibly do on this list? And I finally went, physical education. I can do this. Ballroom dancing and handball. This is perfect. I'm telling you the truth now. And so I, I you know, I finished, I finished college, thank goodness. And so I went into the head coach, and I'm going to see what kind of football fans we got here. I went to the head coach and volunteered to the head coach. I said, can I work for nothing? Okay? And he said, yeah, I think you can do that. His name was Don Coriel. I don't know how many of you remember Don Coriel. Most people think he should be in the Hall of Fame, and I agree. And here's what Don said. He said, Joe, he said, I, I, I think it'd be good for you to start coaching under my defensive coach. See if anybody recognizes this name. John Madden. <laughs> Madden. Every time I hate, it's the game, it's TV, it's Madden, Madden, Madden. I start off coaching being a gopher for John Madden. The whole, my biggest job at night was to go over to the local Jack in the Box and get the hamburgers and tacos. <laughs> I'll tell you something about Madden. Only time I really got in trouble with him, if I left something off that hamburger, I was in trouble. That man can eat, okay? The other thing is, hey, I'm going to tell you, Madden, he's got no pride. Have you seen him? He does Ace Hardware commercials. I've been to his house. This guy doesn't know lefty, lefty, righty, righty on a bolt. I'm there for Christmas, true story. He gave his wife a crescent set for Christmas. She does everything mechanical around the house. It's documented. The man is coming to work one day, had a flat tire, got out and went to his neighbor's house and called his wife to come and fix the flat. I, I throw that in for free. Oh, Madden, you have that. Okay, okay so I bounce around the country coaching in a few schools, Florida State, and in the process, Southern Cal, Arkansas, I wind up getting picked to be the head coach of the Washington Redskins. Un unbelievable. Okay? Now, I go, I figure, this is awesome. Got Pat, J.D. Coy, we moved there. I said, this is great. I'm going to get a chance to be the head coach of the Redskins. I don't know if any of you followed my career there. I start out 0 and 5. I lost the first five games I coached. I figure at this point, I'm going to be the first guy to get fired and never win a game in the NFL. Okay, 0-5 in Washington is a big deal. I was just looking for, for a different way home at night. I told Pat, please sell the dog. I'd hate to come home and see him draped over the steps. I mean, <laughs> I'm doing anything I can. So all of a sudden, we kind of get things squared away, win some games, win a few Super Bowls. And I'm telling you how smart I am. And so we go about 11 years. And all of a sudden, I had my second son playing in college. Wanted to see him play, Miss J.D. I walk into Jack Kent Cook, the owner of the Redskins. I said, Mr. Cook, it's time for me to step down. I walk out, shut the door, and I went, oh, my gosh. What did I just do? What am I, what am I qualified to do? What have I been doing for 25 years? Stand on the sideline going, hit him, kill him. And they actually paid me for that. I said, what, what am I going to do now? I said, holy mackerel. So I started thinking and started thinking and started thinking. And I finally went, I'll become just like you guys. I'll get me a Coke, a hot dog, an instant replay machine. I'll watch that coach on the sideline make those split-second decisions. I'll think about him for about 10 minutes. I'm not sure he's made the right decision. I'll become a TV analyst. This is perfect. I mean, after all, Madden did it. <laughs> I follow Madden into football. Now I follow him into TV analyst work. Okay, if, if you guys see what they paid him the last year to do TV analyst work, he worked eight million dollars. Eight million. I said, look, I know I'm not as good as John Madden, but surely I'm one eighth as good. <laughs> and hey, listen. 
So then what do they do? They put me in the studio, and they give me as a partner, Dicka. <laughs> Holy ma, I agree. I mean, I, I, every time the producer asks us to do anything, Dick is going, we got to get out of here on time. And he starts in with the I'm going, Mike, shut up. You're going to take me with you. I'm smart enough to know I can't do anything else. He's not. Okay, so, hey, I got to tell you a Dick story. I got to tell you a Dick story. Wouldn't be fair if I didn't give you a Dick story. He's my favorite person in life. We're doing a playoff game in Green Bay. Some of you might remember it. it was Atlanta versus Green Bay. And so, man, we go up there. The first thing they do is ask you what? Hey, who do you think is going to win the game? So we're doing the pre-show. And so they come to me, and I, I look around that stadium. There is 70,000 Green Bay fans there. And so I'm looking there, and I go, I, I, I think Green Bay is going to win the game. <laughs> <laughs> Not real smart. They turn to Dicka, and he goes, they don't have a chance. The Falcons are going to kill them. Now, this goes out to 70,000 people, okay? We're doing the game. People are standing up at their seats yelling four-letter words at Dicka, okay? Sure enough, Green Bay kills them. Now we're doing the wrap-up to the game. We go down on the field, okay? Me and Dicka on the field. I don't know. Did you guys know that it snows in Green Bay? <laughs> Snowballs, okay? <laughs> Dick and I are, I, I, I'm ducking and dodging. Dick is ducking and dodging. You know what I mean? And somehow we get through this thing. Now I got to get to the far side of the parking lot to get the limo to go to the airport. Man, I take off running. The only thing I can outdo Dick in, I can outrun him. He's had three hip replacements, okay? <laughs> I'm cutting through the parking lot. And you hear people out there going, Dick! Where's that dick? And I said, I think he's right over there. <laughs> I get to the limo, okay? And so I'm in a limo for about 10 minutes. I said, when this guy shows up, think about it. He's been called every four letter words you can think of. Okay, hit with snowballs and chased through a parking lot. I said, when this guy gets in here, it's gonna be something. All of a sudden the door flies open, dick climbs in, pulls out a big cigar, lights it up, looks over at me and he goes, I guess we showed those guys, didn't we? <laughs> and if any of you tell Dick I said that about him, I'm gonna kill you. That man can pinch my head off with his fingers. He's also one of my best friends. All right, now, I shared with you how smart I am. Now it comes down to the last thing I share with you on intelligence here. Think about my life, okay, so, Coaching the Redskins, man, I'm 25 years doing that and everything. And so with the PE brain, okay, I'm thinking about this as I go. And I said, I'm killing myself coaching the Redskins. I'm sleeping at the office three nights a week, busting myself. I'm trying to figure this out. And I said, I'm doing all the work and the owner is getting rich. Okay, the most I could win in a bonus is $70,000. And I had to win a Super Bowl to do that. And I said, so after looking at this thing, I said, man, if I get in something else, I'm gonna become the owner. I figured that out. And so I moved over to the racing and I became the owner. I showed them, yes sir, I showed them. I'll tell you how smart that is. Three years into racing, we won a big race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Bobby Labonte was our driver. Man, I get up the next morning, on Monday morning, I got the paper, Pat's cooking breakfast. I'm going down through there, I'm looking for NASCAR, I'm looking for Bobby Labonte, I wanna see how much money we won. And I look over there, $110,000. I said to Pat, I go, Mom, we won 110 grand yesterday. I don't know about you guys, but my wife loves the buck. Man, she was fired up cooking breakfast. And so, after about, I sat there for about 10 minutes, I started thinking about this, and I said, wait a minute, we took three cars down there. We wrecked two of them. I just lost $50,000. <laughs> so every time I walk up to the drivers on pit road, they're getting in the car. And I say to them, I go like this, I go, okay, you get to drive a race car for a living. Are you kidding me? Everybody wants to drive a race car. I said, the second thing is you make all the money. If we win that race this weekend, Kyle Busch gets half the purse. 
He pays four people to drive his motor home, work around the house. I get half the purse. I pay 600 people to work on his race car. Okay, and then the third thing is, the third thing is, they all got great looking gals. They got the girls, they got the money, they got the fun, man. So I'm just telling you, if you get into racing, be a driver, okay? <laughs> Don't be the owner. Now, I went through all that, to be honest with you, up front, told you how smart I am. I kind of went through my history and everything, so you guys get stuck listening to me. I want us to think about something for a minute here. I want us to think about, and I want to ask you a question. Let's try and answer this. What is life? Okay, what's life? I don't know, maybe because I'm the football coach or whatever. I thought a lot about that. What is life? We're all living it. And so I came to this conclusion. Life is a game. It's a game. You and I are the players. We're playing in the biggest game of all, and none of us want to lose in the biggest game of all. Okay? All right. So if life is a game, if I'm right, then we should be able to compare life as a game with other games, right? There should be some comparisons there. All right. <clears throat> I get to pick the game this morning. I want to compare life with the game of football. <laughs> One of the few things I know something about. Okay? I've been honest with you. Now, as soon as I said football, I know I have an immediate connection with all of you. Because here's what I've learned in 25 years of coaching. Almost everybody in America thinks they know a lot about football. Did you know that? Okay? Got a connection there. Now, I illustrate that by telling you this little story. I flew into downtown D.C. I wanted to go to the football stadium. I walked out in front of RFK Airport. I hailed a cab, okay? I get in the cab in downtown DC. If you get in a cab in downtown DC, odds are that person will have not been in this country more than two weeks, okay? I told this guy I wanted to go to the football stadium. Now you'd think a cabbie in downtown DC would know how to get the two things, the White House and the football stadium. This guy didn't have a clue. So here I am, the coach in the back seat, directing the cabbie on how to get to the RFK Stadium. I said, down here, take a ride on 7th Street. So about five minutes into this ride, this cabbie turned around in broken English, and he goes, you, 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 you coach the Washington Redskins. And I went, yes. <laughs> he, he recognizes the old coach. I was feeling pretty good about myself. He goes about two more minutes and he goes, you, 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 you need to throw deep more. <laughs> so, I know we have an immediate connection with you guys. You're in probably the sporting capital of the world. You got football, you got basketball, you got college football. And so, I know I have a connection with you guys. So when we start out, I want to compare football for a few minutes with the game of life. Okay? All right, what's the first thing you gotta have to have a great football team? Don't tell me players, what do you gotta have? You gotta have the coach. You gotta have the coach. Otherwise, you got guys like Joe Theismann wanting to call their own plays and draw stuff in the dirt. I said, you're not gonna do that and get me fired. Okay? So think about us playing a game of life, you and I, comparing it to football. The first big decision I ever had to make I was in elementary school, I was nine years old, and here's what the teacher was telling me in school. Two amoeba happened to hit in a muddy puddle of water two billion years ago, and I was the result. <laughs> PE major, not real smart. That didn't sound very good to me. <laughs> she was telling me what? I was an accident, okay? Something blew up, and we all wound up here. Man, I, I got thinking about that, and I said, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. All right, and when I talk to people, uh, I, that many times they say to me, Joe, if you can prove to me God exists, I'll believe. I think I can do that, as crazy as it sounds. I think I could do that this morning. Just bear with me for a minute. Take a look at this, watch. 
What would you guys say about this watch? Hey, complicated piece of machinery, man. It's got a second hand, a minute hand, keeps perfect time. So if I asked you, do you think somebody made this watch? Every single person here would do what? Complicated piece of machinery. That couldn't have just fallen together. Somebody had to make it. So where there's a watch, we all say what? There's got to be a watchmaker. All right, let's think about this earth and the way it's put together. We have the plants outside putting off the oxygen you and I breathe. We have men and women, the ability to love each other. How about the feelings we have for each other? I remember standing outside of the delivery room waiting on my first grandson, okay? Joe Jackson, named after me. He gets anything he wants, okay? I'm standing out there, I hear that little guy crying. 15 minutes later, they bring him out. I swear to you, this happened. They put Jackson in my arms, and he immediately went just like this. His eyes went right to mine, and it was like he was saying, Coach, let's get it on. <laughs> the feelings that we have, most of you have had that feeling. Your kids, your grandkids, those feelings we have, could that be an accident? Is that possible <laughs> that that was an accident? I don't think so. Okay, so if you think about that, is it possible this all fell together? I don't think so. Where we have a world, I would offer to you, we have a world maker. We are going to Mars, okay? They're not looking for people up there. They know there's no people. They tell me they're looking to see if there's moisture on Mars. Between me and you, I don't give a flit if there's moisture on Mars. <laughs> if they want to spend a billion dollars, go ahead and look. My point is this. We can't find another earth like this anywhere. Perfectly made, men, women, ability to love each other, everything that we have. And so I say to you, where there is a world, an earth, there has to be what? An earth maker. And so that's the first thing. We've got to have the right head coach. Who is that possible? It's God. God has to be our head coach in the game of life. All powerful, all knowing, all loving. Isn't that great? All right. So we got our head coach. We got the perfect head coach. The game, now we're comparing football with the game of life. Okay. What, what's the second thing that you got to have to have a good football team? You got the coach now. What do you got to have? Players, man. Players. I had great players. Art Monk, Joe Jacoby, all those guys, Dexter Manley. All right. I cared for my players. My job was to help them to be the best they could be. Still good friends with most of those guys. And when you stop and think about that, okay, how about, okay, does God, if he's our head coach, care about you and I? I remember the first birth of my son, JD. For the first time in my life, I would gladly sacrifice myself for my son. And I know most of you are that same way. Okay, does God care about you and I? Think about what it says in his word. He had one son. That's all he had, Jesus. He was willing to send that one son to this earth. It's documented here he lived a perfect life. He then allowed him to go to a cross and be crucified on a cross so that you and I could have forgiveness of sin. He arose, he's sitting at God's right hand, okay, and he's our path back to God. Does, does he care about us? Definitely, we got the right head coach and we got a head coach that cares about us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that great? All right, got the right, got the head coach. We got the players. Okay, third thing, we're comparing football with the game of life, third thing. You know what I love about football? It's a team sport, okay? We're counting on each other. 
You see that quarterback? If you want proof it's a team sport, well, look at that quarterback's eyes when he goes to the line of scrimmage. <laughs> he looks over there at the defense and he goes, they're going to try and kill me. You guys keep them off of me. It's a team sport. Hey, the linebacker's counting on the defensive line. Safety's counting on them. Hey, we're counting on each other. All right. If you and I are playing a game of life, are there people counting on us? Well, I share, I share this, this little story. Okay. <clears throat> In 1983, we had one of the best football teams I think has ever played in the NFL. We went 14 and two that year with two one-point losses. We had Theismann at quarterback, Riggins. We had Dexter Manley. We had a, we had this team. I'm telling you, I, I, I thought it's one of the best teams to ever play in this league. We had just won a big game at RFK Stadium. I got up the next morning. We're going to get ready that week to go down and play the hated Dallas Cowboys for the division title. I've looked around the room. I know there's no Cowboy fans here. You can spot them a mile off. It's, it's off. It's just off. That's a joke. That's a joke. Okay, I know there's probably a Cowboy fan or two. Okay, and Audi. We're going out and play the Cowboys. Think about my life. Everybody in Washington is writing all great things about me. You guys, once you know how smart I am, they're trying to say all this stuff and everything. So, man, I got up that morning, I got the paper out, and I'm looking at all this just awesome, strutting around the house like we do sometimes in the morning, you know what I mean, feeling pretty good about myself. I'm going to go, hey, get ready to coach this team. Isn't it great the way God gives you just the right wife? And halfway through the morning, Pat said to me, hey, pick up your bathrobe and socks. I thought the nerve of her speaking to such an important person this way. <laughs> she read the paper this morning. And then as the morning kept going, she starts sharing some things about J.D. and Coy, my two boys. I don't know how you got it. Sometimes, you know, I get upset. I kind of stormed out of the house, slammed the door, but I made a promise to myself. Here's the promise, a good promise. I try and pray in the car on the way to work. And halfway to work, it dawned on me. And when I got to work, I called Pat. And here's what I said. I said, Mom, what you're taking care of at home, our two boys, is more important than what I'm taking care of at work. The papers, TV, the media sells us on what? We come out of school, you and I, we're competitive. How do they say we need to be successful? Make money? gain position in the company. In my case, win football games, win races. Man, we go charging, and if we don't watch it, I'm speaking to myself now, 10, 20 years, and all of a sudden we go, oh my gosh, I missed the most important thing in my life. My kids and the influence I'm having on others. Because what, what? That is gonna be the most important thing we leave on this earth. You know what it says in God's word? It says someday you and I are going to stand before him. And he said the only thing that's going to be at our feet is what we've done for him. I don't know about you guys, but that scares me. I can see me standing there and God's going to look down and go, Joe, you got about 25% of what I wanted you to do. <laughs> that's scary, isn't it? Okay. Think about by being in this room, you guys are in the top 1% in the world for being achievers and getting the opportunities to do what you want to do. Most people in the world never get to have a breakfast like we had this morning. Never get to be in a meeting like this. But we're what? We live in America, greatest country on earth. Can we take credit for that? <laughs> it was just a gift. God allowed us to be born here. But think about this. The people that are counting on you, by being here, you guys are having influence on family, your, your kids, your grandkids, and all those people that you're around. And I think for all of us, it becomes, the question becomes what? What is my influence? Because that is going to be the only thing we leave on this earth. All right.
Got the head coach, all right? Got players. It's a team sport. We're all counting on each other as we play the game. A lot of people are counting on you, okay? So we got a team sport going. All right, the fourth thing, comparing football with the game of life. Fourth thing. Hey, you know what I love about football? Man, we go out there and we play that game. 60 minutes, the last tick, we look up at that clock, we've either won the game or lost the game. I love that. Hey, we have six days to get ready, play the game, we win or lose. Me and Dicka, we used to walk off the studio and I go, did we win or lose today? And he'd go, I, we have no idea, he said. Somebody's in the back room taking notes. I don't like that. Winning and losing, clock ticking on you and I. Is there a clock ticking on the game of life for you and I? Absolutely. I lost my dad at 74 years old. I lost my little spiritual father at 76. I'm coaching the Washington Redskins. One of the greatest players to ever play in the NFL was a safety named Sean Taylor. You guys probably know the background there. 24 years old. Heard something in his house at night, got up, went downstairs to defend his family from a break-in and lost his life. 24 years old. We don't know, do we? Clock is ticking. We don't know. I'm 76. Some of you should say, well, you don't look it. <laughs> hey, before long, I'm going to be sitting in an old age home with a bunch of other old guys, and I'm going to be going, I, I, I coached the Washington Redskins. And these guys are going to tell the nurse, hey, get this nut out of here. He thinks he coached the Washington Redskins. Is that the most important thing I'm going to leave on this? I don't think so. My kids, grandkids, and then for you and I, the influence we're having on others, that's all that's going to be left. That little spiritual father, been gone 25 years. His house isn't there, okay? None of his money's there. What's left of George Therrell? What he's done for me. The influence he's had on me and others. That's what we're going to leave on this earth. All right, four things there. Comparing football with the game of life. Fifth and last thing, what was the most important job for me coaching Washington Redskins? Man, I came in on Mondays, it was what? Craft a game plan. Me and the coaches, Mondays and Tuesdays, worked hard, stay up late at night, get the game plan. The players come in on Wednesday, we put in first and second down. Thursday, third down, two to six, plus 20 yards. We put the game plan in in segments. Odds are, we got a good game plan, we have a chance to win the game. Okay? Think about that. Okay? Game plans. Is there a game plan with an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God put us on this earth without a game plan? I don't think so. It's right here. Now, you won't prove that God exists. This book, I think, is proof that God exists. This book was written by 40 authors who didn't know each other over a period of 1,500 years, okay? Three languages, two continents. Is it possible for that many men to write a book that's been perfect from the beginning, Genesis to Revelation, okay? Is it possible for them to write a book like that for it all correlate? This book predicted in the Old Testament 300 predictions about Christ coming to this earth living a perfect life, being crucified on the cross, and returning to him. 300 predictions that came true. This book predicted there was going to be an Israel when there was no Israel. This book told everybody that the world was a globe when everybody at that point thought it was flat. It's a miracle book. Forty guys, could they write a book like that? I illustrate this by telling you a little story. This would be close to home. I got a chance to come down and be the offensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Bucks. John McKay, maybe some of you remember that era, 74. I come down here, we had drafted, I'm gonna see how many football fans recognize this name, Doug Williams. <laughs> Doug Williams, man, we drafted him in the first round, 17th pick in the first round, okay? 
I'm going to call plays. In those days, we couldn't talk to the quarterback like we do today, so we developed a signal system. Here's one of our signals. I write, fake, zoom, 70, chip. That's the play we went off tackle in our first Super Bowl against the Miami Dolphins for 44 yards and a touchdown with John Riggins. Fast, quick. Man, I'm all set. Doug Williams, a rookie out there, and we start the season. Okay, I'm sick of most plays on the sideline. Well, in those days, as you guys remember, we lost the first two games we played. Okay, Coach McKay, you guys remember Coach McKay, tough guy. He came to me and he said, Joe, I don't like these signals. I don't know what those things are. He said, I want you to tell a receiver on the sideline. He'll go in and tell Doug Williams and Doug Williams will give the play to the team. I said, okay, Coach, you're the boss. Took off. I'm calling the plays to a receiver. He's in the bay. We lost two more games. <laughs> Coach McKay came to him and he said this. This happened. He said, Joe, I don't think you're comfortable down here calling plays. I want you to go up in the press box, call the play down to an assistant coach. The assistant coach is going to give it to a receiver. The receiver is going to go in and give it to Doug Williams, and Doug Williams is going to give it to the team. Okay? What, what, what's wrong with that? Okay? Hey, here's one of our plays. Trips right, fake zoom, Liz, 585, F cross sneak. You try calling that the receiver that's been hit in the head three times? <laughs> Doug, Williams, Doug Williams is looking over going, what? Hey, what, what's, what's the problem? You've been to the party where you pass the sentence around the room, it gets to the fifth person, what? You can't understand what the sentence is. Is this a miracle? 40 people writing a book it's been perfect from the beginning to the end. This book will speak to you if you're on God's team. It comes alive. I've been in trouble with this thing. Got up in the morning. I said, what could the Old Testament? I'd be reading in the Old Testament. And there it is, a game plan for the day. All right? That's what we did. Okay? I think there's some comparisons there. What's life? Life's a game. We just compared it to football. Got the right head coach, we've got players, it's a team sport, okay? We've got a clock ticking, and we got a game plan. That to me, okay, if it is then, then the key becomes for you and I is what? To make sure before that last tick, we've done what? Won the game. You got stuck this morning listening to me, okay? All right, think about my life. Man, I'm rocking and rolling through there. I got, I got a wife I don't deserve. I got two great kids, I got eight grandkids. They paid me that money to stay on the sideline and coach football. Man, I'm rocking and rolling. What can happen when you play games? You can have a loss, okay? I get the job coaching the Washington Redskins 1981. Here's what I said to myself with my PE brain. I said, I'm not just gonna trust God and coach. I gotta use this platform I'm a young coach, short contract, not making a lot of money. I got to use this platform to get rich. And with my PE brain, I said, how do you get rich? I thought about it and I went, real estate. You can't lose in real estate. <laughs> and I see some of you smiling. And then I said, again, looking around the country, I said, where am I going to invest in real estate? And I went, Norman. Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm going to invest in Norman, Oklahoma. They have oil and gas. Their economy will never go down. And so I got in a simple partnership with some other guys. Here's what they said to me. They were my buddies. They said, Joe, we'll lose every dime we got before you lose a penny. And they did. <laughs> Three years later, I'm coaching football. I start getting late notices at the door. Sent Don Meredith, a friend of mine down there, not the football Don Meredith. He came back and he said, Joe, when the season's over, we got to get down there. Go down for our first meeting. Two accountants, two attorneys. We start adding up everything that that partnership was deficiting on. I got in a simple partnership. People in here know real estate know what that means. I didn't even have to be there. If they signed for something, I was signed. The other four guys filed bankruptcy. They were gone. 
I was the only guy left. We got through adding that stuff up this mo that morning. This partnership was deficiting at $30,000 a month in interest only. I was bankrupt. Now I'm sharing with you one of my messes. The rest of them are in that book. Okay? This is one of my messes. What was I doing? I was playing the game of life without what? Studying the game plan. I was on God's team. I wasn't studying the game plan about finances. What topic does God talk about more than any other topic in his word? Finances. Over 2,000 times. Wasn't studying yet. Made those mistakes. Now I'm going to kind of share with you. If you're on God's team, though, if you're on God's team, he knows everything in your life. Okay, in my case, he knew, okay, I needed to go through that. All right, I can remember getting down on my knees that night in Norman, Oklahoma, the tears are rolling. I called Pat, and I prayed to God that night, and I said, God, I'm a fool. I've been playing the game of life without studying your book and your principles. You know what the very first principle in this book is? that God lays out for finances, never co-sign a loan unless you're willing to pay it off. My case, really a fool. Pat and I talked about it, prayed about it, and, I, and we both said, look, we don't think we ought to file bankruptcy. We need to go to each one of these banks and try and work something out. Nine loan, loan institutions were involved with that partnership. Four of those institutions went under. That's how bad the economy was. We go to the very first banker. I'm sharing with you now what God can do in a mess. And I don't know what your mess is. It could be a relationship, an addiction, a financial deal. I'm sharing with you the way God can work in something that's monstrous. All right, we go to the very first banker. He said to me, he said, Joe, give me $80,000, <laughs> which I didn't have. I'll put it in a 10-year annuity, and I'll let you off of what you owe at this bank. Oh, oh $70,000 in a loan, a $1.2 million apartment complex, and 17 lots at this one bank. I walked out there. I had a friend with me, and he goes, hey, look, this is a huge mess. I got a good business friend okay, that I know, Don Carter in Dallas, Texas, okay, he owned the Mavericks. He said, let's go down there and talk to him. I said, I've never met the guy. Go down, sit down with him. He said, tell me. I started five minutes into me telling him the story. He said to me, stop. What do you need? I said, I need $80,000. You don't know, talk about a miracle. He said, follow me to the bank, gave me a cashier's check. I went back to the bank, handed it to the banker, Okay, I walk out on the street, that friend of mine turned to me and he goes, what happened in there? I said, I don't know, but let's start running before he figures it out. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm telling you now what God could do in a mess. I go back to coach the Redskins. On my desk was a card on my desk. And here's what it said, it was from a banker. Okay, Tom Schaefer. It said this, you have been referred to us as a preferred customer. <laughs> I went, this is perfect. I'm in a mess. This guy says this. I go down and met with Tom Schaefer. Here's what he said. Look, when he heard about all that, he said, look, here's, we got a game plan here. You go coach the Redskins. You give me your check each week from the Redskins. I'll give you enough to live on, and we'll start paying this off four and a half years, four and a half years. About halfway through that thing, Pat rolled over one night in bed and she goes, life is not much fun. And it wasn't. Four and a half years going through that. As we went through that and came out the other side, I started making a list of things that I learned by going through that mess. 15 things. You know what number one on the list was? Listen to your wife. She didn't want to do that. I found a way to make her do that. Listen to your wife. 
From that point on, Pat makes every decision financially, she has to agree to it, okay? Even in racing. I don't think she knew what she was getting into, but we're, even in racing. My, my point is, God knew, okay, I needed to go through that. He was preparing me because he was letting me have some things later on. So for you, I just use that as a testimony to you. You guys got stuck listening to me. I don't care what your mess is. If you're on God's team, okay, nothing is too big for God. He'll walk you through there and take you through that. Okay, so in closing, I think the thing I would like to say to y'all in closing here, we're going to have a little prayer in a minute, okay? But before we do that, I think the question becomes, whose team are we on? There's only two teams in the game of life, two teams. You play with God and play with him forever, or you play against him and you play against him forever. I was reading one night, it was my job to put the boys to bed. I was reading one night about heaven. Coy at that time was only about eight. I finished reading and he looked up at me and he goes, Dad, I don't think I'm gonna like heaven. I went, Coy, why would you say that? He goes, laying around playing a harp? <laughs> I said, Coy, if it's a laying around playing a harp, God's got a lot of work to do on me too. Read the chapter in that book on Randy Alcorn. He's the expert on heaven. Randy Alcorn said, that is not what heaven's gonna be. We're gonna know each other. We're gonna still compete. That thing is gonna be awesome. You know what God says? It's gonna take us a thousand years to begin to appreciate heaven. Is that great? I told Coy, I said, Coy, you know what I think heaven might be? A thousand year football game. A thousand year race. God made us. He knows what excites us. Man, isn't that great to be on God's team and know we're going to spend forever with him? Listen, God made us with a soul, and he says to us in his word, we are going to live forever. Okay? And the question is, where? So this morning, I just want to ask you a question. Okay? And this question is going to tell us whose team you're on. The question is this, can you point to a specific time and place in your life where you ask Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and be your Lord and personal Savior? If you can, at that point, we are sealed. Nothing can take you out of God's hands. Isn't that great? Nothing is too big for him. We're on his team. Now, some of you here might be like I was, gave my life to Christ at nine years old, like I said, <clears throat> in college, veered away from God. 32 years old, coaching at University of Arkansas, that little spiritual father. I'm around him and some other coaches, and I said, oh my gosh, these guys are living for God. I'm on God's team. I'm just not living for him. And I got up and went forward in church that night and said, God, I want to rededicate my life. I've been on your team. I just haven't been living for you. So some of you might be in that category. Then there's a third category. I'm sitting uh, in a bleachers waiting for my grandson to finish football practice. Nobody else is in the stands. Big line coach is walking out, going to practice. He veered off and came right over to me, Mark Howard. He looked up at me and he said, hey, Joe, I want to share something with you. And I said, what's that, Mark? He goes, two years ago at your very first game plan for life, I gave my life to Christ. Amen. I went, Mark, are you kidding me? You never said a word to me. He goes, I know. He said, hey, I just didn't want to bother you. He said, the crazy thing was, after God, I gave my life to Christ, God started working in my life. This guy owns his own concrete company. Big old strong guy, got these people at work for him. He said, I've never taught anything in my life. But God kept telling me, you need to start a prison ministry. <laughs> he took our game plan for life small group study, rewrote it, went up to Salisbury prison and started taking 10 prisoners through game plan for life. 
Okay, now, here's what's happened after that. We had other people come from the state, listen to him, and we got other people working in churches, what have you. Then he came up with the idea that he wanted to have, work with a seminary, okay? This had been patterned after Louisiana, what they did in prisons there. Take lifers, they're never gonna get out, take them through a four-year seminary study, give them their degree, then transfer them to other prisons in the state and they will be there leading people to Christ. It's totally changed the prison system in Louisiana. Can you believe we are doing that right now? We have 30 lifers because of Mark Howard and one guy saying to himself, I'm getting off the sidelines. I'm going to get in the game for the Lord. You guys here, the talents you guys have, okay, maybe some of you, or saying to yourself this morning, I'm going to get off the sideline. I'm going to start working for God. So it's three categories. Giving our life to Christ, okay, rededicating our life, or maybe some of you saying, hey, look, I, I just want to get in the game. So I, I'm just going to pray for us here for a minute. If we could, everybody just bow your head. God, before we have that little prayer, I just want to pray for everybody here, and I want to thank you on behalf of everybody here. Thank you for letting us be born into a country where we have freedom of choice. Thank you for the fact we have an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving God who knit us together in our mother's womb. And the amazing thing is you want to have a personal relationship with us. We th thank you for that. I pray for every person here and so this morning, if there's anybody here that has a desire to make one of those three decisions, give their life to Christ, rededicate their life, or get off the sidelines and get in the game, it's my prayer that they'll pray this little prayer with me right now, meaning it in their heart. And that prayer goes like this. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you sent your son to this earth. He lived a perfect life. And you allowed him to go to that cross and be crucified on that cross for me so I could have forgiveness of sin and a path back to you. I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and be my Lord and personal Savior. Amen. Isn't that great? It's, it's that easy? Now, there's three things God says we need to do. Okay, we get on his team. Serious prayer. Take him with you all day long. Okay, serious Bible study. Get in a church or get in a Bible study with some other people playing on God's team. You can help them play and they can help you play. Three things we need to do. Now, having said that, Taking a stand for God, does that take some courage? My whole life, hey, as a coach, I've admired people with courage. Football players that cover kickoffs 50 yards and make a tackle. Race car drivers at 200 miles an hour. Mothers and fathers that work two jobs, are dedicated to their family, have the courage to get up and do that every single day. I admire people of courage. Does it take some courage to take a stand for Christ? Okay, making that decision that we made this morning, does this take some courage? Think about this, think about this. Crucified on a cross, that took courage. And that's what Christ did for us. And he says this, he would have done it had it only been you on this earth. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Isn't it great? I just share with you guys this morning the most important thing that was ever shared with me. My prayer is before this day's over, everybody would make sure that we're on God's team. I appreciate getting this opportunity to speak with you guys. Thank you for having me here.